All right, everybody, uh, we'll get started. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, my name is Jason Key at SP Grid at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, thanks for joining today. Today, we will be hearing from, I actually have uh, a two part, uh, two parts from Willie Riggers. So uh, today is Willie's going to focus on situs uh, and talk about uh, electron density fitting uh, from cryo data. And um, and the next session will be another Willie. He's going to talk about Sculptor. And then in December, we'll have X, XM DFF, which is uh, Molecular Dynamics Flexible Fitting with Abhishek Roy from uh, Klaus Schulten's group in Champaign-Urbana. <clears throat> so um, with that, uh, Willie, take it away. OK, awesome. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to your user community. I look forward to this, and um, I would like to get started. Uh, with my picture actually I was asked to show a picture because I don't have my webcam on so I'm currently at Old Dominion University I'm a, a professor in um, mechanical and aerospace engineering I'm also working in the Institute for biomedical bio, uh, engineering and um, so I previously worked at Scripsto with Ron Milligan who's an electron microscopist and then later at, in, at the University of Texas Health Science Center and uh, more recently in New York City. So I've been around and uh, my, the SATOS program that you're hearing about today uh, has also been around for quite a few years, since 1998. And um, so let me uh, move on very quickly. I know this is not a historic review. It's mostly su supposed to tell you a bit about uh, SATOS, current SATOS functionality, but I wanted to tell you a, a little bit about the history of fitting in cryo-EM because it's actually a fairly recent idea. The first paper that performed fitting uh, manually was in 1992 published by um, uh, Tim Baker and Jack Johnson uh, where they looked at um, antibodies in the presence and, and absence of um, a, a virus capsid in the presence and absence of antibodies that were uh, decorating the virus capsid. You see here on the left uh, two uh, EM maps that were resolved then by difference mapping, subtracting those densities from each other, they were able to identify individual fab antibody densities shown here on the right, and they were fitting the known atomic structure by hand at the time. And that became very popular in the mid 90s. And then um, uh, I came on the scene when I was a grad student, actually in Klaus Schulten's lab by coincidence also at the time, uh, attending various um, so Klaus has been also a player in this field for a long time, uh, prior to uh, MDFF even, and XMDFF. Uh, and I came, I, I worked, I published a paper with him. Uh, here you see Klaus Schulten as a third author in 1998 on using a neural network approach uh, for fitting, where we actually looked at uh, f simulated fiducials, um, fiducial markers that were placed in an EM map and we use these simulated fiducial markers for anchoring atomic structures to the simulated markers. This is an effectin model uh, we created that way. And the precision of placing these fiducials was actually quite good. And that was the origin of the CITUS package that you're going to hear about today. We published a paper in 1999 on this um, back when I was with Ron Milligan at, at Scripps. So um, I think this is a suitable breaking point now. Before I, I tell you the details of CITUS, I want to show you very quickly um, the website. Um, so the CITUS website has actually quite a number of features uh, and, and um, useful information for you. For example, I want to point out uh, that um, uh, there is a user guide and we also have tutorials. Let me t start with the tutorials. You see that there is a large number of tutorials. When you click on one of them, um, they always have the same structure. They start with an overview, a workflow, uh, and then you see detailed um, command line uh, interactions um, in the Unix shell, um, and then the output results as they are being visualized. Um, the user guide is also very useful. Um, there's actually no written user guide. There's only an online user guide. So. Um, I recommend that you take a look because the tools that I'm going to talk about today, for example, Colores, have quite extensive documentation online. And you see typically here um, uh, the usage at the shell prompt, 
specified and then a number of uh, uh, input parameters and arguments that can be added. They're being explained in detail here. Um, so there's a lot more detail, of course, than I can cover in um, half an hour. So that's why I want to quickly show you the website, um, especially the user guide information that is available here in the tutorials are going to be of much help. And I'm just going to give a very um, a superficial overview of some of the new features that are in Satos. And first I would like to start though with uh, the Colores program, which is sort of our workhorse uh, fitting method that has been around since 2002. Um, Colores is using a technique called template convolution and it can be graphically shown uh, in a simplified way as follows. So you have uh, a probe molecule that's being uh, translated across uh, a target uh, EM map. And uh, when you find a good match by a virtue of a cross correlation scoring function, uh, you will save that uh, particular location. Okay, and here might be another one. Okay, so the, the positions are being saved. So this scan is done um, very efficiently internally through uh, fast Fourier transforms. Uh, actually, there's an um, we take advantage of the Fourier convolution theorem to do this very efficiently in the Colores package. But you can see that after applying this for particular orientations, you then get a pretty good idea where the correct positions and also the uh, correct orientations of the particles are. And that's done by looking at the cross correlation scoring function at each point. So see, in this case, we didn't find a very good match because the orientation is off. So then you would use a different orientation again. So you see that the structure of the program is that you perform a six dimensional search, essentially, three translation, three rotations. And the translation are fully accelerated and the rotations have to be done exhaustively uh, and then the information has to be saved in um, in uh, a list of possible matches and that then being refined further for subsequent analysis okay so that's the structure of the colores program and what you get as output is in addition to the fits a correlation landscape which is essentially the scoring function as a, a, a function of the position um, which is also called the translation function um, in crystallography actually. So uh, in this case we take a slice through this map and uh, look at the uh, a projection or not or a slice of this uh, 3D uh, correlation landscape just um, you see here the x and y coordinates and since this is a donut shaped uh, EM map the, the translation function shows a, a, you know a, a circular has a circular appearance here. Um, okay so um, the problem that arises here is that you can see in such situations um, the fitting provides a number of uh, spurious fits as well. So you have uh, a number of ambiguous positions here because the correlation landscape in this case is not um, uh, uh, unambiguous. So there are multiple spurious fits as well in addition to the correct ones. And the reason for that is that for resolutions in EM maps of about 10 angstrom or below, um, uh, you are losing detail in the maps, uh, so you're losing secondary structure information, and that is a problem that uh, that limits the use of cross correlation uh, docking uh, criterion below 10 angstrom resolution. So, uh, Colores traditionally used an approach that uh, we implemented was called density filtering, where we use additional information from the surface, the contour of the map in the fitting. So we use a filter that in addition to positive density denoting the interior volume uh, of the fitting, we also uh, designate uh, contour information by putting now positive values on the contour and negative values on the inside, the interior uh, volume. And when you then perform a matching, um, the surfaces where the surfaces line up, you get a positive cross correlation. Now you get also positive cross correlations from interior fitting. And you only get a small penalty when surfaces are intruding here in this case. So in situations where there's little buried surface, like uh, when, when the buried surface is negligible compared to the exposed surface, uh, the, the addition of contours in the fitting can be very, very powerful. And Colores is taking advantage of that by using a so-called Laplacian filter that um, creates out of a Gaussian uh, shape, uh, which you would uh, sort of create this inverted Mexican hat type uh, filter function. Uh, and when you apply this to an, a density, 
we see that we nicely uh, now can tell where the interior density is with negative values and also the surface features and positive values are, are considered in that. And it turns out that adding this to the fitting gives you much higher precision uh, and also accuracy, I should say. So this is a restoration test with simulated data where we looked at the accuracy of fitting for um, tra transitional, tra uh, traditional cross-correlation co coefficient in red. Um, we also used the local masking approach uh, that I don't have time to talk about uh, in blue and uh, the Laplacian filter in green. So you see a big difference uh, in accuracy. So typically at the resolutions that are below um, 10 angstrom, so in this range, uh, the Laplacian filter is necessary to get relatively accurate fitting um, because the fitting breaks down at some point and you want to push that point where it breaks down to very uh, large numbers here in the resolution scale. Um, whereas the breaking down point of the traditional uh, cross-correlation score is about a 10 angstrom uh, and the Laplacian can push that out to about 25 to 30 angstrom, which is uh, giving you enough room to work with for low resolution maps. So there was one advantage of using Colores, uh, but it's actually still competitive today, um, even though it's uh, uh, 12, 14 years old now, um, this approach. Um, uh, very recently, um, uh, Philip van Petegem in his lab have published a, uh, a docking study with 10 angstrom EM maps, where they fitted this uh, very, very tiny um, Sprite 2 domain of the Rhinidon receptor into, into the map. And you see that um, uh, the fitting here uh, is, is very um, questionable. So one has to be skeptical about this because the domain is so small. Uh, so one wonders if the fitting is, is accurate. It actually turned out later when they solved the structure that uh, they were off only by two angstrom RMNs D from the, the later solved structure. So that was quite remarkable. And they got that good uh, result only with uh, turning on the Laplacian filter in Colores. Um, it was not possible to get to an accurate and uh, uh, fitting with any other approach. So there was a nice success story uh, that I want to mention here that uh, this tool is still widely used today and, and, and seems to be successful when people work with low resolution data. Now, uh, a new approach though that we more recently implemented um, is implemented in our collage tool. Collage is a new uh, idea based on um, the refinement uh, aspect of uh, co Colores that I mentioned earlier, where we actually performed in a refinements subsequently after we find the peaks of the cross-correlation landscape, this translation function, we actually refine those peaks. And that was done as a standalone tool in the collage. And the trick was that we added also the capability in collage to do multi-fragment refinement using a simultaneous refinement um, of multiple rigid bodies. So that's a new paradigm that's actually an alternative to using Colores, uh, which I would like to introduce because many people don't know this, uh, that this uh, functionality exists in Saltos, but uh, it's actually even better than uh, Colores and gives you more precise results in many cases. Um, it's using a conic and gradient optimizer using a Powell approach with six n degrees of freedom where n is the number of fragments. Okay, six is the rigid body degrees of freedom. So this is still a rigid body fitting approach, but now with multiple fragments simultaneously optimized. The advantage is that the fragments now can see each other as opposed to in Colores where we do it one at a time fitting. So now you can avoid steric clashes through a normalization of the cross collation. So this is the equation for cross collation coefficient. Uh, you see that's an integral over the uh, EM density and uh, translate and rotate its atomic uh, density. And then um, this normalization here um, uh, basically in rho calc uh, leads to the fact that when two fragments overlap, then this uh, part uh, of the normalization here increases in value, which will decrease your cross correlation coefficient. So there's a soft penalty built in that avoids steric clashes. And that leads to when you have multiple fragments, like in actomyosin filament fitting, uh, where the, the myosin S1 heads are simultaneously docked and also the, the actin subunits. Um, when you, in situations like this, you, you get actually uh, improved docking accuracy, as we've shown in this paper. And then um, also, uh, naturally, since this is an iterative technique, at each step of this uh, iterative method, we can enforce symmetry. And it's also supported in Saltos. There's the symmetry builder 
that create symmetry mates at every step and you can uh, run this in a Unix command shell uh, in a bash shell uh, quite efficiently with symmetry constraints turned on and um, you know get uh, symmetric uh, symmetry like helical symmetry is supported and also um, uh, C and D symmetry um, that is widely used in, uh, in EM um, uh, that gives you uh, more accurate uh, fitting of course as you compared to individual um, uh, fits of single particles and or single fragments and it allows you to take advantage of the known uh, symmetry of the EM map in many cases okay so um, this new paradigm is really very powerful. We recently modified it and applied it also in a new tool called Voltrack. Uh, Voltrack uh, can be used for two applications. The first application is in alpha helix detection. It's actually a very powerful um, uh, secondary structure detection tool where we take multiple fragments uh, and they're actually optimized in this case with a si in a six dimensional search with a genetic algorithm. And then we find optimal placement of these seed templates in, in the structure. And uh, these templates, in the case of alpha helices, are just cylinders um, that match the shape of alpha helices in a low-resolution EM map. And then uh, these cylinders are extended in the, in both directions. In, in you see here in the uh, in the positive and a negative direction of of the density. And uh, thereby you can trace the density up until a stopping criterion is. Um, uh, satisfied where the overlap between the template and the density is no longer uh, given at the ends of the density. Okay, so then you can trace these uh, the the um, alpha helical axis. And you get a pretty good idea where the alpha helices are, and we compared this, for example, with known alpha helices shown in yellow here in the crystal structure of Grow L. You see that our predicted ones in blue are quite uh, in good agreement with the known ones, except this very small one we were not able to detect. Because the density here doesn't show look like a sausage uh, uh, that cor would correspond to an uh, atomic uh, uh, to, to an atomic helix. Okay, so here the density is, is a bit deformed, and therefore we were not able to detect this very short helix. But all the other longer helices, longer than about five um, amino acids, we were able to detect reliably with this approach. And um, I'm collaborating here with Jing He, who is an, an expert in secondary structure prediction in the maps here at ODU. And she has tested uh, Voltrack and found to be um, on par with her best methods. So it's actually quite a competitive technique that's uh, very very usable. And another uh, application domain of this is in tomography. Actually, we, we used uh, Voltrack to take um, uh, tomograms, in this case of uh, Philopodia from uh, Dictyostelium. Um, that was a collaboration with the Baumeister Group in Martin Street. Our Local contact was Alexander Rigord, and then the data came actually from Ohad Medalia originally. And uh, you see here these alpha helices, uh, these these actin filaments. Um, well, it's a bit bigger than alpha helices. These are actually fairly huge actin filaments um, that are embedded in the um, uh, philopodia structure. And we were interested in finding an automated method to trace them uh, directly. And uh, Voltrack. Uh, was actually quite a powerful tool that allowed us to segment out the actin filaments in the uh, tomogram and separate it, say, from uh, other shaped um, uh, features such as ribosomes and storage vesicles here. And also, you can see the membrane that we were able to segment out. Um, so, uh, Voltrack is actually a very powerful tool and uh, works on a variety of filaments. And I highly recommend that you try it out for alpha helix, alpha helix detection, but also if you work, happen to work on tomograms on uh, identifying and segmenting out um, uh, filaments in tomograms. Uh, currently, we're trying to extend this method to membranes and also to identify other uh, shapes. Okay, So that's what's going on right now in, in CITOS. So uh, I would like to perhaps, we still have a little time, eight minutes, would like to talk about validation practices because um, uh, that's a frequent request from users who are using our tools for fitting, they would like to know um, how can we validate the models. And actually, as a matter of fact, it's not so much the users, but when they try to submit a journal publication, the, the uh, reviewers of the publication are often, often requesting some sort of uh, validation strategy to make sure the fitted models are accurate. 
uh, and here I have some suggestions for you based on um, work done by us and also the work done by Philip von Petegem who has tested our tools uh, using his own work, uh, his own data as templates. So the first suggestion is that um, if you want to make sure the fitting is accurate, um, um, you, you can use different cry EM maps and often EM labs have them available at various resolution levels or you can divide your images into two classes and then perform reconstructions independently for both halves of your uh, data sets and then compare um, the fitting um, either with a, a low resolution earlier map that your lab might have created uh, or with the other half of your test um, uh, system that you use for the reconstruction and that can be a very useful uh, approach to show what the variability of the fitting is and, and how stable the results are. So in, in this paper, uh, Tang et al, in this nature paper, Van Petegem has actually done this for rhino dyne receptor uh, complexes and he has used our tools and described in the appendix, in the uh, supplementary information, how to uh, validate um, using this approach uh, in Colores, the, the results, uh, so the reviewers were satisfied with these predictions. Now, a limitation of this approach is, of course, that a comparison with older data, uh, it tells you more about problems in your old map, possibly, than about the reliability of the docking to the new map. So, um, so uh, you know, taking an older map is sometimes problematic because it might not be as reliable as the new map, and then the comparison is not so meaningful. So a second approach that can take that gives you more precise maps to work with is to use simulated maps. Say if you have an atomic model or a known structure, you can use our PDB to wall tool and uh, low pass filter uh, the atomic structure to create a simulated EM map. You can then perform docking of the fragments, the subunits, into the simulated EM map and look at the root mean square deviation. And uh, that gives you then an idea of how accurate the docking is. That's a validation technique. Um, I already showed an example of using simulated maps uh, earlier in an earlier slide, okay, where we used uh, the different uh, filtering approaches in Colores. Now, uh, a limitation of this approach, I must say, is that using simulated maps is overly optimistic because they don't have artifacts from 3D reconstruction in them. Uh, there are no heterogeneity issues. Um, there are no um, there is no Fourier ringing, there is no noise, um, uh, no CTF correction, all these uh, issues that um, can make interpretation of EM maps difficult are sort of avoided by using these very clean, overly optimistic uh, simulated maps. So, But they are useful for validating docking techniques. Um, and in some cases, also, you can make sure that your fitting is accurate. Um, in so if, if your fitting, for example, does not work for low-pass filtered uh, structure, then I would really worry. Um, so it's a test that one should do, but it might not be the, the final test that really validates the, the fitted result accurately. Um, and then um, you can also perform a statistical confidence analysis. That's a technique that was pioneered by uh, Niels Volkmann, actually. Um, a uh, long time ago, and uh, Tang and co-workers also used that approach. So what you can do is you can look at the precision of your fitting by looking at the distribution of possible results within a confidence interval. And that gives you then an, a, a, an ensemble of possible fitting results, and you can look at the 99% ensemble and look at the variability. So that kind of precision can be a very useful tool. Yes, we have also done such a precision, precision analysis in 2001 with our match point tool uh, in CITOS that, uh, and compared it to accuracy. Now, one problem with that approach is that we found out, and also others, is that the intrinsic statistics of the docking precision, which tells you about the variability of your results, actually does not tell you how far you're from the true solution. So the accuracy, which is uh, the, you know, the difference between your solution and the known, uh, uh, the unknown, I should say, the unknown true structure, that is a problem. So for example, in this case, we found some very high precision results that had uh, low accuracy here. Okay, So you can have these outliers, um, and uh, that is a problem uh, when you compare precision with accuracy. So precision is not always a predictor of accuracy. Okay, It's a useful tool, 
but it only tells you about intrinsic variation of uh, fitting results, not about how, how far you are from the true solution. Um, so uh, in this paper, um, Van Pettigem also performed an extensive evaluation of Coloris. And one tool that he found particularly useful was to plot the docking contrast, which is the um, uh, normalized cross correlation coefficient uh, compared among the ranked solutions uh, that Coloris returns. And he found that the highest result was uh, much better than the subsequent ones. And that can sometimes be a very useful um, approach. There's a limitation that if you have very low resolution maps, the docking contrast might be quite low. Uh, or um, it's very it's sometimes possible that you have induced fit confirmation changes that are not captured by the rigid body fitting. And then a suboptimal fit, like a second or third solution in rare cases, might be the actually the accurate one. So you need to have other knowledge to support your uh, uh, docking contrast based prediction. And um, it's not 100% reliable because there might be induced fit changes in the structure that uh, limit this approach. Finally, um, um, I just want to point out that uh, you can also use different modeling strategies. Uh, for example, you can use our CITES tools and compare them to other packages. There's a la large number of fitting programs available and see if the results are in agreement. So it's a sort of a meta-analysis of multiple packages. You, since most of them are using cross-correlation coefficient and similar approaches, so of course this is not a truly independent uh, validation, but it is giving you an idea of how well uh, the, the, the different fitting programs agree. So definitely use uh, other fitting programs and compare them with Salto's results. Okay. Um, in, in this paper, they showed that Laplace filtering was absolutely required for docking of any smaller units. And uh, so the size limit of the docking is sometimes a problem. And you have to keep that in mind uh, when you use this approach. Okay. Um, so if you have different outcomes in such a meta-analysis, you need to resolve them. So for example, if two different programs give you different results, that could be a concern. So we also have recently implemented a new technique for validating fitting using track fiducials. So that's new in Satos 2.8. Uh, and you can read this paper in more detail. But what we do there is um, when you have a structure that's very, very close to a known EM density, we can actually track uh, the, the marker. We can put simulated markers there and track the features as they differ between the crystal structure and the EM map. Now, uh, they should not differ by much, but they differ very slightly because of some artifacts in the map and also the, some fitting in inaccuracies. And this type of tracking can give you very precise information about how accurate local features are in uh, when you plot, for example, the feature drift as a function of uh, um, level of detail in your um, um, uh, coarse grained um, representation, uh, you can see that in um, first, uh, firstly, we compare three different methods here. You see that in the best method, which was this green one, um, there's still a, an, um, a lower bound, if you wish, of the fitting error, which is at about one to two angstrom. And that's due to deformations of the um, EM map relative to the known crystal structure in this case. So it is sometimes useful to do this type of tracking to, to look at differences and, and identify more detail uh, than visually um, what's actually happening there. And that also t could possibly tell you about discrepancies between the EM map and, and the crystal structure that have to be looked at in more detail. And the most important um, approach is, of course, to compare with existing knowledge. So we, we think that there's no way, this is really the final answer. Um, when you do fitting, never trust any of this previous criteria, but uh, compare with existing knowledge. So you are the best expert because you really study your biological system. And so you might, for example, know about distribution of disease mutants, uh, some surface features that are important. Labels have been put on by certain people. Um, or alanine scanning mutagenesis, what have you. The people have performed various biophysical uh, experiments to identify the features of the structures. And so, so you should use this complementary biophysical or biochemical knowledge to verify that your predictions are correct and make sense. And that is probably the most powerful validation technique that you can use, but of course it's system specific and uh, 
it's some um, work that anybody who is an expert in a particular system has to do when they write their paper in the end. Okay, so with this, um, this is the most reliable validation strategy. With this, I would like to uh, close and just as a take home message, I want to point out that flexible and rigid body docking uh, that Citus performs can be an order of magnitude above the normal resolution in terms of accuracy. Uh, and we have two programs one is Citus, which is a Unix command line based program, um, and then um, a, a suite of programs that run in the Unix command line. And then Sculptor is a GUI based, graphics based program that I'm going to explain in November, okay, November 1st. So uh, I would also like to thank a number of folks, uh, in particular over the years, Publisher Con, uh, Julio Kovac, um, Mirai Bella Russo, um, Manuel Wale, and Jing He have made s some important contributions. And this is our website, and we have had a number of collaborators over the years as well. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Great, thank you very much, Willie. Um, um, we had a couple uh, during the presentation that I'll pass on. Some of these you may have talked about a bit, so uh, you may want to just sort of expand over what you said. So uh, one question was that after the Caloris run, what sort of threshold values would suggest a good fit and you know should be reported? I think you touched, you, know, you talked about this a bit, but I think. In terms of actual like numerical thresholds, is, are there values that would be, um, you know, sort of yeah. okay? That's definitely good. And then just a sort of follow up on that one was that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. let's say we're working in a negative stain uh, map uh, of about twenty seven angstroms. Could could Caloris reliably be used to dock that? And what would the workflow mm -hmm. sort of be like? Right. Uh, so first about the docking contrast, I think. I put some limitations at the bottom, and one of them I, I skipped over, which was using the Laplacian filter. So often, when you have very low resolution data, like uh, negative stain data, you have to absolutely use the Laplacian filter. And then um, this docking contrast might not look as clean anymore. So it gives so the, this profile depends a, a bit on what filtering technique you use, uh, as you can imagine. And um, also using single Molecules versus multi-body docking gives you different profiles also. So this is sort of an art a little bit. It's not uh, very precise, but if you want to, me to give you a number, I think um, if there's really a gap like this, where from the first to the second solution you have a factor two, that would be huge, right? So it's really an indication that there's clearly something favorable going on. But um, often you find that these lower ranked solutions are also very close because uh, remember we do a uh, rotational search and maybe the next best solution is very very close in, in terms of orientation and just off by five degrees so it, it depends a bit on your parameters that you're picking okay so um, if you have very fine sampling of the orientations then the, the contrast of between the best solutions might be diminished uh, so you, you sort of appreciate that this is not a um, a strict um, tool to really help with evaluating or validating uh, fitting results, uh, because and, and I mentioned already in induced fit cases that it might actually be that the first solution is not correct, but the second or third one is correct, and that is a that these are and especially with negative stain, I would also be really worried uh, because negative stain basically gives you a different shape from what you would expect from a low-pass filtered um, atomic structure and um, you're lacking the interior detail and also the surface features are slightly off you might get some um, you know uh, inaccurate results so that some of your uh, initial results might not be accurate but then a later one might be so you absolutely need to verify this further with some of the other uh, validation techniques that I showed okay so that's not sufficient For negative stain, okay. All right, great. So uh, got one more here. Hold on one second. Uh, oh, one question. Uh, there was a, a discussion of the fiducial marks uh, of uh, in uh, fitting. Could you uh, just give a an overview of uh, how fiducial marks work? Um, yeah, and, uh, I did not. Um... I did not mention it in the talk because uh, Colores and Collage are the most widely used tools. But uh, if you go to tutorials, uh, the classic EM tutorial has an overview of fiducial markers, how they can be used. 
and they can be used for both rigid body fitting and flexible fitting. And here they're used for rigid body fitting, but let me go to part two. Plastic EM tutorial part two, I think has, yeah, they're not shown here. I think, let's go to flexible fitting. Uh, I think uh, the flexible docking tutorial um, uses fiducial markers for flexing. And that gives you an overview. So here we have actually deformed uh, an, an actin structure where we try to take the original uh, G-actin in red and fit it to the EM map in, in, in the green solution is the fitted one. Um, now um, here we use four fiducial markers for the four, four subdomains but uh, in the flexible docking tutorial here you see that you can actually use a network of fiducial markers and then keep some of them rigid, some of these um, uh, uh, vertices rigid uh, to stabilize this network that allows you to keep some parts of your structure rigid during the flexing and then this network that you see here is being flexed uh, where the um, uh, this structure is essentially free to rotate about those joints so every ball here is a joint and uh, what you keep rigid here is the longitudinal distances now uh, if you're really interested in this, this would take probably an hour or two of explanation. But the tools that perform this type of calculations are QuanVol and QuanPDB. And uh, there's actually also a tool built in that performs flexing. Um, and that flexing tool is uh, called um, Qplasty. Qplasty takes fiducial markers and performs some quick flexing of the structure. So uh, now these flex structures should not be taken um, uh, directly and, and published, but they are basically a, a good first uh, approximation of the conformational change that you would like that you have tracked with those fiducial markers. And what you should do after a Qplasty run is to take the final result and run it through an external refinement program like RefMac, for example. Uh, RefMac takes the structure and uh, optimizes the geometry and so I re recommend doing that because it gives you a cleaner looking um, structure. RefMac is also used by the uh, EMDB or and by the PDB to um, validate uh, models and so I highly re recommend using a tool like RefMac after those Qplasty runs uh, because Qplasty is just performing a very simple deformation using these markers. Okay, But you see this approach is quite powerful you can use these fiducial markers both for placing, for identifying position um, uh, of, of subunits and, and features, but we can also use them for flexing, which is implemented here using the Qplasty tool. Unfortunately, I don't have more time to talk about it, but it's all explained in the tutorial here and in the user guide, so uh, feel free to explore these tutorials. They're very intuitive, I think. Great. All right, with that, uh, we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much, Willie, for the, okay. the great talk on CITUS, and I look forward to uh, hearing about Sculptor next month. Okay, great. Thank you.